All right, welcome everybody to this uh, discussion we're gonna have about Red Nation Rising from border town violence to native liberation. Uh, first off, I wanna thank everybody for joining us. I wanna thank PM Press who published the Red Nation Rising book for their contribution. I would like to thank Between the Lines out of Canada for publishing Brotherhood to Nationhood and the Making of the Modern Indian Movement. Here's a little screen of what that book cover looks like. I don't know if you can see it. I know uh, Doreen probably has it behind her if you want to show that to us. And then here's the Red Nation Rising book that we're here to talk about. Here comes Doreen with, you got Brotherhood to Nationhood there. Perfect. So we're going to talk pretty as as vigorously as we can about you know this whole idea of of border towns and violence and all that. But before we get started, I would like each of our panelists to introduce themselves, and we'll start with Doreen. If you could tell us who you are and where you come from, maybe where you exist right now. Sure, I'm Doreen Manuel. I'm Sequapmik and Tanaha. My traditional name is Kanthlupakakin. It means running wolf. I'm living on the unceded and stolen territories of the Squamish, uh, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam people in North Vancouver, British Columbia, so-called Canada. I have a MFA from a local university. I'm the sixth child of Grand Chief George Manuel and spiritual leader Marceline Manuel. I'm a residential school survivor, mother of three, and award-winning filmmaker. I'm the uh, first Indigenous person in Canada to be a director of a major film centre, the BOSA Centre for Film and Animation. I'm also the first Indigenous person to hold a seat on the Board of Directors of Knowledge Network, which is one of our local broadcasters. And um, I also serve on the Board of Directors of Women in Film and Television Vancouver, the Vancouver International Film Festival, uh, Moving Images Distribution, and I serve as one of the uh, committee members on the Motion Picture Production Association of BC Equity and Inclusion Committee. And I'm an advisor to the TELUS Indigenous Working Group and to the uh, Telefilm Indigenous Working Group and a founder of the Tricksters and Writers Screenwriting Program for Indigenous people and a founder of the Digital Accelerator, which is a fund for Indigenous business people, and a founder of the uh, Filmmakers and in Indigenous Leadership and Management Business Affairs Program for Indigenous producers. But beyond all of that, uh, my involvement and interest is carving out Indigenous representation in the film and television industry, but above and beyond is my investment in time and energy and my love for my people and our traditional role as land and water protectors. Thank you. Great. Jennifer, how about you? And you'll need to unmute. Yeah, it's a Jennifer today. I'll share. Look at Shlon, I see him bash his chin, kill chinny, dash a chay, to a head, cleaning, dash another. But I am a American. Professor of American Studies at the University of New Mexico. I'm a historian by training. I am also the chair of the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission, and I am a citizen of the great Navajo Nation. Yate. Thank you. Kanahus? Kanahus Peshki request. Hello, everybody. My name is Kanahus Peshki. That means red woman in Tanaka. I'm from both the Sequatmook and the Tanaka nations in the mountains, so-called Rocky Mountains, what people will refer them to. I'm living right now in Blue River, I'm calling to you from a tiny house warriors, that's a tiny house on wheels that's deployed in the path of the Trans Mountain Pipeline and man camps. I'm here in the heart of our territory, asserting our title and rights um, for our land. I'm all about indigenous liberation and freedom for our people. Thank you. Also. Doreen Manuel is my auntie. Thank, Thank you. you. Melanie? All right, yeah, hey everyone. Uh, my name is Melanie Yazi. Bilagana Nishle, Ma'adesh Kijni Bashish Chin, Bilagana Dasha Chil, Totsani Dasha Nala, Behalge de White Cone, Arizona, De Nasha, Kut Al Sadanen Nishle. Just want to greet you all as relatives, as comrades. 
um, here in the struggle for indigenous liberation. Special shout out to Dr. Jennifer Dennett Dale, who is a longtime mentor of mine. So it's a pleasure to have co-authored this book, but also to be on a panel with her. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of Native American Studies and American Studies at the University of New Mexico um, here in Tiwa lands, otherwise known as Albuquerque, um, occupied Tiwa lands, otherwise known as Albuquerque. Um, I'm also a co-founder of a grassroots indigenous liberation organization called the Red Nation. Uh, and I still organize with the Red Nation. We were founded in 2014. We might talk about that a little bit today because um, we were founded to address specifically border town violence um, and violence against our urban native populations and relatives. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to this evening. All right, and my name is Chris Latre. I'm just gonna be the moderator. I am Métis and I'm a proud member of the Little Shell Tribe of Chippewa Indians. Uh, located, based in Great Falls, Montana, but I live just outside of Missoula, Montana. And we are the 574th federally recognized tribe, which really shouldn't mean anything, but it kind of does, because it's nice to finally be recognized for who you've been all along. Um, and that kind of brings us to the theme of the one theme, I think, that, that ties, no matter what we talk about as it relates to indigenous liberation, is settler colonialism. And that's something that gets thrown around a lot. You know, settler colonialism is the cause of this. And this is our situation because of settler colonialism. But I'm always curious as to what people's ideas of what settler colonialism even is. And I thought a good place to start is if Melanie could tell us what settler colonialism is, because that is the thread that ties all of this stuff together. For sure. Thanks for that question, Chris. Um, you know, something I said in the past, and I think I'll start out by saying it, uh, you know, I'm a professor, right? So I'm in the, the academy in the United States and um, settler colonialism has become sort of a trend uh, and kind of more progressive or radical scholarship to theorize. And there's a lot of good work on it, but sometimes I see this, what I find to be a troubling trend where people wanna talk about settler colonialism without talking about indigenous people or indigenous nationhood or histories of resistance. So. Something that I started to say when I present on settler colonialism is that settler colonialism isn't always about indigenous people, but wait, what? I also already got that. I got it wrong already. <laughs> I was starting out so good. It's, it doesn't always have to be about native people, but it is always about us. You can't ever talk about settler colonialism without talking about indigenous people, right? And the theft of land and our projects for liberation and decolonization. Um, so indigenous people should always be in whatever like understanding you have, you know, or movement that you're building to fight back against settler colonialism, you know, and something. So what is settler colonialism? I'll talk about it in the context of what we call border towns, reservation border towns here in the so-called United States. So at its most basic, settler colonialism is a structure that animates liberal nation states, um, specific types of liberal nation states that were founded by settlers and it was a type of invasion right where like the native population was to be eliminated disappeared and killed in order to replace indigenous populations with a settler population so the united states and then canada where uh you know my sisters Kanahos and dorina calling from are both settler nation states right and so settler colonialism in both of those contexts is alive and well and again right it's about the elimination of native people primarily to gain access to land, right? And so that elimination looks like a lot of different things. It looks like imperial conquering um, and, and conquest over indigenous nations, the denial of, an, of ongoing indigenous nationhood and sovereignty. It looks like the targeting of indigenous or native women by the state. Um, this is why we have something like MMIWG that we have to contend with because it was our women primarily who held those customary leadership roles and kind of the customary laws and forms of governance that indigenous nations practice long before the United States or Canada ever came here and started their violent project of settler colonialism. And I call it violent, right? Because if you're gonna try to eliminate an entire population of people in order to replace them with another population, you're gonna have to engage in genocide, right? There's only, there's only one way to go about it. And that genocide happens in a lot of different ways. It happens through outright killing and massacre, right? It happens through violence against women, like I said. It happens through polluting the land so thoroughly that native people can no longer live on that land. How that's happened primarily over the last hundred years is through resource extraction, so oil and gas 
drilling, uh, you know, coal mining, uranium mining, right? It happens through refusing to actually enforce treaties, right? So the US illegally occupies millions of acres of land that quite literally like legally don't belong to it, right? So using the law as a form of genocidal violence against indigenous people. I mean, like really the list goes on and on and on, right? In terms of like the different mechanisms and technologies of genocide. But in like the border town, so what happens in reservation border towns, right? So native people were like, progressively removed off of their land into reservations. So these small little chunks of land, um, often many of us have reservations. Navajo Nation is considered quite large, but it's way smaller, you know, than the land we used to be able to migrate across um, in this region. So we're on reservations, which is like where we're supposed to belong, right? That's where native people are supposed to exist. But when they go off reservation in a place like the United States, i.e. a border town, which literally is like, could be like a quarter of a mile from a reservation boundary, all of a sudden we're not where we're supposed to be. And then we become this threat, right? Cause the settler mentality, right? Is that like, oh my God, Indians are supposed to be gone. Indians are supposed to be disappeared and eliminated, but here's a bunch of them. Like in Albuquerque alone, we have almost 300 indigenous nations represented in the population here. We have one of the largest like urban native populations, 10% of our people, Jennifer's and my people live in Albuquerque. It's like 35, 40,000 Diné people live here alone. And we're, that's just one nation out of those 300. And so in border towns, we're literally everywhere. We come here to shop, we live here, we go to school here, we have jobs here, we go here to trade. Sometimes you have to pawn stuff, you know, in order to pay for gas, to buy vehicles, those types of things. We're just kind of living our best life, you know, trying to survive in these spaces and on the reservation. But because there's such a high number of us, whereas if you go to another city, another settler city or a settler town, there aren't any native people in those spaces because we've been so thoroughly removed from the land and from the memory of that place that we only exist as like street names, right? Or like a mascot for like the settler high school and that location. So in border towns, we're very alive. Like we take up a lot of space, you know, we're like, we're at Walmart, we're at the gas station. You can't go anywhere without seeing us. And so what happens in these spaces is that our very presence, our, our aliveness, you know, threatens the, the larger settler mentality and expectation that we should be dead, that we should be removed, that we should be over there on the reservation and not here where settlers have to feel uncomfortable, right? By just being in our very presence. And so something we talk about in the book is that this helps to explain why there's such high levels of violence against native people in reservation border towns, right? Because if you're seen as a threat and if there's too many of you, then you can be called all kinds of names you know, you can be stereotyped in all kinds of ways, like, oh, there's a drunk Indian, or oh, that Indian's out of control, or oh, that Indian is doing a protest, they need to be arrested and brutalized, right? And so you see this type of settler identity that we now call fascism, I think, especially after last summer in the United States during the Black Lives Matter uprising. Let me tell you, like, the, the white dudes with guns, the cops with guns, the white high school students with guns, like that homicidal type of settler hetero, white settler heteropatriarchy is always existed in reservation border towns. And so that, that type of like, if you have like the, the white dude with a gun in your mind, like maybe like a militia that we faced on the streets last year or something, that person has long dominated and really enacted the kind of violence that native people have to experience in these spaces. And of course, you know, our native relatives who live on the streets, um, women, those engaged in the sex trade, right? Those who have trouble with housing or just are poor and working class native people bear the brunt, right? Of this violence because they simply don't have the social and economic security or the safety net to be able to have any type of buffer from it. And so the property owners who do, who run all of the predatory businesses in border towns, pawn shops, car dealerships, trading posts, right? I'm, I'm thinking very Southwest specific here. They all, you know, they all participate in this like really violent rampant form of anti-Indianism against native people. And so if you really want to know what settler colonialism is like, like at a very material level, just go into a border town, just spend, just spend a couple hours there as an Indian walking down the street, being native in public is seen as a crime, right? You will be profiled when you go into shops, you will be followed by white shop owners. 
you know, you might be solicited if you're just a native woman, just like trying to sit in a, a damn park, <laughs> you know, to drink coffee or something, you know, like all of that stuff is very normal in border towns. And so, like I said, the, like the petty bourgeois class, whether it's like cops or vigilantes who have a lot of extra income to buy guns because guns are very expensive or those shop owners, or usually the politicians who kind of go across that spectrum, they are all, they all participate, right? In this hyper, this hyper vigilant violence against native people. So if I'm gonna talk about settler colonialism, I'm just gonna, you know, violence, violence. That's really all it is. It's a system and a structure of violence and that's how native people experience it in all of these different ways. So I hope that helped. <laughs> sure. Well, I think of, you know, one of the things that the book has, like really broaden my perspective of is like, what is a border town? So like where I live in Montana, you know, I think of Great Falls because it's close to the Blackfeet Reservation. It's close to Rocky Boy um, or Billings, which is close to the Crow Reservation and Northern Cheyenne. Yet in Montana, you know, uh, uh, some of the statistics like we have is only 7% 7 of our population is indigenous. And yet we occupy 30% or more of the incarcerated population, for example. Um, if you want to talk about land, like you mentioned, you know, the, the interaction between the settler colonialism and the hunger, insatiable hunger for land and resources, like 10 private owners own just as much land in the state of Montana as all the tribes combined. So it made me really think about the fact that like, for me, Montana, the whole state is a border town because everywhere that, that, that we would go, you know, as indigenous people, we are going to be the, the ones that are somewhere where we're not supposed to be. Like you mentioned, as far as being off the reservation and the way that we choose to use, you know, the American military being off the reservation or going into Indian country, all of these things that paint it as a picture of, of the enemy and the thing that needs to be conquered, the people who need to be killed. And Jennifer, I know, you know, you, you were a big part of, you know, putting together this, this book and, and identifying, you know, it's, it's like a, almost like a almanac of all the different ways that, that Indians are, are held in kind of this third rate non-human almost percentage of the population that must be eliminated. And I'm, I'm kind of curious about, you know, what was the process for identifying, you know, like, like the sections, like, you know, anti-Indianism and Indian killers. What, what does it mean? Who are the Indian killers? And, and just some of those other types of, you know, we think of violence as like actual physical violence, but, but the propagation of, of, of payday loan things and stuff is a kind of violence. And, and the systemic impoverishment of people is a kind of violence. I mean, how did you like distill all of that stuff down to have something as concise as what we have, you know, it's almost like an action, you know, a, a, a manual, you know, a manual for action. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, um, uh, Melanie, for your um, definition of settler colonialism and border town. Um, in terms of the origins of this uh, book, a collaboration among four of us, um, all four of us um, in different ways have had um, observations and experiences of border towns and these experiences and observations are not different from a lot of indigenous people. You know, you have these kinds of spaces in um, Canadian um, towns and cities where indigenous people are present, but they're always pushed to the periphery. And so um, here in the Southwest, we have the same kind of phenomenon and it's, um, uh, uh, with, within the definition of settler colonialism, it's not, and, and people tend to think about this settler violence as something that's isolated and it just happened mom momentarily. But I think in the larger view of the structure, one of the things that we put out there in terms of this book is that this is a long standing um, historical uh, phenomenon of just constant uh, violence against indigenous people, you know, this displacement is historical. Uh, and so in terms of the essay and then the, the, the terms, um, I grew up in Tohatchi. I'm from, that's where my, my grandmothers are from. My maternal grandmothers are from for generations. Uh, my great, great, great grandfather was Husky Jilha Jine, And my grandmother, my great, great, great grandmother was Hassan Tloge. 
Um, in the English words, they're known as Manuelito and Juanita. Well, they were, they're the faces in American history of the resistance against first Mexican invasion and then American invasion, okay? Um, and when the Diné were defeated um, because they were literally starved into submission by the American forces and then removed to a concentration camp um, beginning in the summer, the fall of 1863, um, and then they returned to a, a portion of their home homeland in 1868 and these settler towns um, start emerging because they see in, indigenous people as uh, a way to make profit, okay? Um, to, to the Indian trade is what they call it. Um, their labor, um, the things that indigenous people Denim make. And so the, the, the uh, border towns are historical, okay? Um, my great, great, great grandfather um, in the late 19th century traveled to border towns like and the one that I'm most familiar with is Gallup, New Mexico, okay? My great-great-grandmother and my great-great-grandfather also experienced that movement, that migrational movement from their communities, their home places into border towns. My great, I have letters from the Indian agent in which my great-great-grandfather has seen Chilhajina. Um, it was like a pass, you know? Um, uh, please uh, let this, man pass, he is a good, a good Indian letter. You know, wonder why you have to have those kinds of letters um, in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Okay, so um, growing up in indigenous town, in, in uh, along uh, coming into border towns, I think what COVID-19 here in the Southwest and, and in the US made very, very stark um, because we were prey um, for COVID-19, it made even more stark that the way in which the, in, uh, the United States and the corporations um, and other um, settlers that have interests, um, their dispossession and their theft um, of indigenous people from land to resources, um, they created an infrastructure which is not one of, of um, subsistence um, for indigenous people. And that was made start, I mean, the Navajo Nation literally has one of the poorest infrastructures in this country. We have one of the richest, hugest land bases and rich in resources. And yet those resources, land, water, air, uranium, created the Southwest as we know it. You know, our dispossession allows for um, white people in Scottsdale to sit in restaurants um, and fan themselves when the cool water mist comes down while they're eating, you know. Um, they don't ever think to thank indigenous people to think to thank the Duna or the Hopi. Um, it is our dispossession and the theft of our resources that allows them to sit in luxury and watch waterfalls go up and down. Uh, whatever you call those things, waterfalls go up and down. You know, um, and so this book then the terms give an articulation to our historical experiences our observations and to our history under settler colonialism. Thanks. Uh, Doreen, this next question, this, um, Melanie kind of alluded to it, you know, like like with MMIWG and, and the work of women and, you know, in your new, in your forward to the new edition of the Brotherhood to Nationhood, Nationhood book, which was about your dad, who, who was, you know, instrumental in, in, you know, organizing native for, for native liberation. And you mentioned in like in your new introduction or for whichever, whichever one it was, um, the contributions of women and how they have not, you know, we go back through history. It's always the, all the men who are doing everything yet. There are plenty of women involved too. And here we have this panel of four women, all of you who are, you know, fierce, fiercely active in native liberation. And, and can, can you speak to that? You know, as you mentioned, talking about your mom um, and, and maybe some of you others can weigh in on just, just the importance that, you know, this isn't a new thing. Women have always been involved yet, yet here we are, you know, we know about all the dudes, but we don't know a lot about all the women. Yeah, in, in my time, you know, the women were the ones who, if it wasn't for the women, the movement would not have moved forward because it was the women who, you know, who 
did all the fundraising and organized in the community to get the community support. Yes, it was the men who went off on the road to go speak because it was safer for them. They weren't going to get raped out there or they weren't going to get beat up out there. Uh, so the men went off to do the speaking, but it was the women who told them what to say and how to say it and what they were fighting for. Uh, it was the women who reminded them that they were fighting for the children, for the future. You know, it was the women who carried that knowledge, our um, matriarchal knowledge and our history to inform them, you know, and I just want to make a comment also about the settler colonialism. You know, all of that is based on the doctrines of discovery, which was enacted to solidify the settler access and to assert their gain of economy. And, you know, when you, uh, and, and it was to gain it at any cost, at any cost of violence. They were giving themselves permission to murder and slaughter whatever people were occupying that territories and lands when they, when they arrived here. If those people did not conform to their religion and to their values. And they explained it to our people in English, a language we didn't understand. And then when we didn't understand it, they just went out and murdered and slaughtered our people. And they're still doing that today. When you look at murdered missing women, uh, and it's not just women. You know, I was looking on Facebook just earlier today and I was reminded that an entire family went missing up north that have been missing for years and years. Um, they criminalize our land and water defenders. My niece, Kana, who's has served time in prison for, for defending our, our territory. They still steal our children through social services, mm -hmm. you know, children right out of the loving arms of their parents. And then those parents become depressed and slide down the hill without their kids. They, they have the, their sense of identity and purpose is altered. So there's these generations that this has been going on. And, uh, but even though that has all been happening, yes, there are powerful women right here. And, and an example of, you know, the power, all of the movements in the 70s that I was part of, which was like the Concerned Aboriginal Women's Movement, the Indian Child Caravan, we rolled into the Constitution Express. That was all women. We had one man spokesperson, and we had a few other men spokespersons that came on later. And then my father joined in with us once we had grew into a really huge movement. And he led us through the Constitution Express because the Canadian government was trying to um, enact a Canadian constitution for the very first time and separate from uh, Europe, from English uh, Britain ties and uh, they didn't have any inclusion of us so we fought hard to get section 35 in and we had to go all the way to Europe so it was actually a man one of the man leaders who said we shouldn't bring children over there it was just just us adults will go and the women just stood up in full force and just sat him down and said if we don't have our kids with us how are we going to know what we're fighting for when we get weak and hungry and beaten down it's looking into our children's eyes that raises us back up into the fighting position and we keep going. Um, and I think that women have always had that incredible power of, you know, being able to overcome anything. You know, like when um, I got out of Indian residential school, well, my mom took me out for a visit and I told her what was going on in there to me, that I was some of the horrendous things that they were doing to me. And, um, so she kept me out, but she, you know, I'll always remember her words. She just turned to me and she said, I'm a brown woman with no education and no money and the entire world against me, but I will keep you out of that school and I will find a way to protect you and raise you. And she did. She, she really did. So yeah, um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Kanahus, we talk a lot about unceded land. That, that's another term that comes up a lot. And you are currently occupying unceded land. It belongs to you and your people, yet you're under threat because the authorities, you know, don't think you belong there. And, and you are literally boots on the ground, uh, active native liberation, fighting against the powers that would steamroll you into non-existence and your tiny house warriors project and all that stuff. And I would just, if you could tell us what unceded land is first, 
And then I would really love your perspective on, on what it's like to be on the ground, like right on the front lines, like you currently are. I mean, that's different than like, I think of the people who protest in my town in Missoula, where everybody politely walks down the sidewalk and they wait for the light to change. And then the light changes and they politely walk across the street. And I'm like, why the fuck aren't you right down the middle of Higgins Avenue blocking traffic and all that? I mean, you, that's, that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for all the speakers and thank you for, um, thank you for asking us all the amazing questions. Um, yeah, unceded, unceded territory. Right now I'm here on unceded Sukhwatmuk territory, Sukhwatmuk Uluh, we call it the land of the spilling waters where all the glaciers form all the rivers for all of the salmon rivers and creeks here in so-called British Columbia. Very important spot I'm in. Um, and unceded, we've never signed treaties with Great Britain, Canada, nor British Columbia here. In um, Canada, there's been treaties signed with the, with the government all the way from the Atlantic coast as they signed treaties, Treaty 1, Treaty 2, making their way west. But everything west of the Rocky Mountains is pretty well untreated. We have no treaty whatsoever with our land agreement with the Canadian federal government. And so we remain wild and free here in our territory. Um, we say we're unceded. And I really, I really believe it, it gives a different... Um, vibe to who we are as Indigenous people because um, as coming from a non-treaty um, band or nation, um, I really feel we have liberation really in our blood and, and freedom in our blood still because we have no ties to, for example, um, you ask a Native person here in, in so-called Canada and sometimes I'm like, hey, what kind of Native are you? They're like, oh, I'm Treaty 3. I'm a treaty three or treaty seven native or something, you know, like, I'm like, what, what is that? We're not treaty. We don't understand what that means to us. We can't relate. We have no point of reference to relate to it. So we've remained very free here in, in our land. Um, one of the things that my father would, our, my father, the late Arthur Manuel would, would say is that, you know, colonialism, it, it has to do with the dispossession of us from our lands. And, and when, we, when we're displaced from our lands, then it creates this dependency on the colonial state or the, mm -hmm. the, the colonies, the colonials. And then when we wanna stand up and fight back, we're oppressed and we're further oppressed and repressed with this police violence and this criminalization. Um, mm -hmm. For instance, here in Canada, if you add up all the Indian reservations here in Canada, it will equal 0.2% of land. So it's a very small percentage of land. My father would always say, you, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to see who is going to be rich and who's going to be poor. And we know that this colonial settler violence has made them very, very wealthy and made both the American government and the Canadian government very wealthy and, and superpowers in the world when it comes to um, economic power. And so they've made that off of the displacement and the dispossession and the genocide of indigenous people that got very wealthy off of it. And it's because of the land. And so here I am unceded territory, uh, building tiny houses and actually living and occupying our, our unceded lands to assert our rights and title, but also as a way you said, protest. It's a way for us to protest. It's a way for us to um, confront the Canadian government. We say right at our blockade, we have our barricade up and that's just right where we face off and confront Canada. Uh, settler colonialism and indigenous sovereignty is right there at that blockade. And so we need blockades. We say blockades are necessary to confront um, these, these colonial settler states that I really don't like the word settler because it feels like it's settled, but it's not settled. There are invaders. It's still happening today. And the government of Canada and the Trans Mountain Pipeline owned by the crowd proves that settler colonial violence is still happening today. Thank mm -hmm. you. Well, it's true. I mean, it's, it's like, I got invited to speak to a class of fifth graders here a week or two ago and they, cause they were doing studies on all the tribes in Montana and they couldn't find anything out about the little shell. And they asked if I would answer these questions. And all the questions were like, what did you do for this? What did you do for that? What did you do for this? And I said, you know, the most important thing that you need to think of is that we're still here. So we still have, it's not like these are traditions that we had in the past. There aren't ways that we interacted with the world around us that happened in the past. And there aren't 
ways that we want to interact with, with our families and our broader communities and our comrades that are all in the past. It's still happening. And that is one of the things that's like, people think we're gone. People think the indigenous people are gone just because they live out East and there's a lot of Indian names around, but no Indians. And, and just that idea that the genocide is still happening. If you look at, you know, like the long game of tribal enrollment and, and how the vast majority of tribes still practice this bullshit blood quantum to determine who can be their members. And I guess, you know, how do we share, you know, how, how do we, how do we find it? Like you said, you don't want to call it settlers because that means it's already done because it is still happening, but we have to share, right? Melanie, do you have any thoughts on that? Do, or do you even hear a question when I'm asking? Cause I wonder about that because I think, you know, part of me is like, you know, fuck all of you get out of here, go back to wherever you came from. Yet everybody I love, cause they're in my 7% of the Montana population. There aren't any Indians around me. You know, everybody I care about is a settler. So I have to figure out a way that I can, can not just be just outraged all the time and, and, uh, and alone, you know? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I mean, so many. <laughs> yeah, I go back and forth on this. I mean, like, I don't know, Red Nation, uh, we just went through this whole thing where there were a bunch of non-native people that we recruited into the organization and then they just turned out to be a bunch of hippies and left <laughs> like you know and then they just like came in like invaders do you know they took advantage of our hospitality didn't really understand like 101 things like sovereignty and indigenous liberation and ate all our food, slept in our house, trashed it, and then peaced out. <laughs> like that's, that happened to us. And we thought, we thought what we were doing was like, was like good, right? We're like, yeah, we're like we're building this organization. And, you know, like because we have these like, you know, foundations of indigenous kinship, like we know like how to be a good relatives to each other, regardless of whether or not we're native. And it really seriously just blew up in our face because there is this expectation. I'm talking mostly, I'm not talking about like the, the fashy, you know, settlers or invaders who just hate us and want to kill us. You know, like I actually prefer <laughs> that kind of approach because at least I know you're my enemy, right? So that's the, cool. You know, boundary lines drawn. I understand. I understand that relationship. But I'm talking more about like people in the movement, like liberal, um, sometimes they're progressive folks. Um, they have this like weird, I think, new agey expectation of like becoming indigenous or they want to like have this like social ex or cultural experiment, you know, and they think with you as an indigenous person, like this notion that like they truly want to belong, right? They want to belong on stolen land. I get that. I get wanting to belong. But then going to that weird place where you're like, oh, will you adopt me? <laughs> you know, those kinds of things. And then like that becomes the basis of your politics. Like that's just the same kind of racism, right? As having a gun pointed in your face, mm -hmm. you know, or a cop brutalizing you on the front lines. And so to those people, you know, I haven't really settled, you know, how I feel about that, but like how to talk to those people, there need to be boundaries. There needs to be a really strong understanding of how like liberalism and I mean, I think people know what cultural appropriation is, but they still seem to cross those boundaries constantly with indigenous people. Like, mm -hmm. please did you invite me into your ceremonies and those kinds of things. Like that's, we don't need a cultural relationship with non-native people. And this includes non, a lot of non-native people of color I don't need a cultural relationship with you. I need a political relationship with you where you are down, at, you are as down as I am for liberation. And like, that's all we gotta do. That's all we gotta do. We just gotta come together and be committed to liberation, be committed to land back, be committed to like overthrowing capitalism because it's literally killing the earth, right? Like this is the stuff that is the basis of our relationship. It's not all of this like other weird, these weird expectations that get imposed on us in the movement. And so I feel like the book does a pretty good job laying out like what those political expectations are and what that relationship is supposed to look like. I mean, like George Manuel is talking about this 50 years ago, you know, Kana House just talked about it. 
in the comment she made about you know why she started the tiny warrior you know encampment there on on her lands and so i don't really understand like why people are still confused <laughs> to be real to be real with you about like what we want in terms right. of relationships with non-native people like land back just means land back so like help us do that because guess what like if native people are able to steward the land again if we're able to restore the land because we have that land back, the value and the relationship that we have with that land will fundamentally shift at like a societal level, not at an individual level. And like everyone will benefit from that. And you know what, when I say everyone, the planet won't die. Let's say you gave land back to indigenous people, guarantee you our species will still exist once that 30 year clock is up for climate change because we make up less than 5% of the world's population, yet we care to take over 80% of the world's biodiversity, indigenous people do. So if you just give us the land back and we're able to just like live on the land and practice the ways that we were meant to, you know, that creator gifted to us, literally the entire world <laughs> will benefit. And, but in order to get to that point, like you need to be on board with the political project of liberation. So I don't know, I don't know if that was very satisfying. I'm, I mean, you, like you, like I have rage. <laughs> Right. <laughs> today well, my, i'm like medium rage level <laughs> like my pet peeve you know living where i do which is a very you know progressive liberal you know kind of island this sea of just like the most medieval back ass words politics you could imagine in, in the state of montana right now is land acknowledgements and it, it makes me crazy because because the way I've termed it is it's like the progressive liberals thoughts and prayers. And like there's a school shooting and all the Republicans are sending out their thoughts and prayers and it's meaningless because nothing is being done to change it. And I feel that way about like land acknowledgements. You've got somebody, you know, on a mountaintop and they're taking their selfie for Instagram talking about how here I am in the traditional lands of whoever and it's like, do you realize you're saying that? And there are nobody from those traditional lands within 500 or a thousand miles of you. And when they were taken, they could be killed if they went back there. You're going to say that, well, what are you going to do about it? And that's why it just feels like the progressive, I'm going to check this box to show I'm a good progressive. I'm a good liberal, but I'm not going to do anything else about it. That, that That's the one that really regularly just makes, because it's such a simple meaningless gesture that we have to get beyond. Jennifer, I heard you maybe start to make a comment when when Melanie was talking. Did you have something to add to this before my head explodes? Uh, you know, I, I don't know if I have anything else to add about it. Um, last week on Thursday, and here I am adding something to it. On Thursday, I, the last th I think it was last Thursday was the um, MMIW Awareness Day. Um, along with that here on, um, in Navajo land, um, the Navakea, um, there was also MMDR, you know, which is many missing and murdered Diné relatives. And many of our relatives go missing and they're murdered in these border town spaces. Uh, and so I attended um, uh, some events on that day. I went down to a vigil, which the Red, or Red Nation had organized for um, Jolene Nez who was murdered by um, the police, by the Senator State, when she was, she was unsheltered, she was on the streets, and she refused to pick up a piece of litter. And so she was arrested by the police officer for not picking up a piece of litter. Um, she then died in um, custody, in jail, um, uh, and it's alleged due to medical negligence. So that was, that day was really hard on me. <laughs> You know, um, and I don't I didn't realize that until later of of the grief that I was feeling um, after doing that all day. And I like to I like I think that what I see happening with the MMIW and the MMDR um, movement is the way in which trauma and grief and loss are being talked about. Could you use the word trauma? People somehow go automatically to concerns about healing, to concerns about some kind of personal, you know, you need to go get a massage um, and talk to a counselor. Um, but what I actually see happening in movements on the ground 
is that these are not moments to sit there catatonic, that people have always actually been moving. And it's been indigenous women that have put this on the radar internationally and nationally here in the US. And it's been Diné women here in the Navajo Nation have raised, that have raised the consciousness about our, our missing and murdered Diné relatives. So I really see a, a shift in the way in which um, the, the consciousness is articulated, you know? And um, I have a difficult time with this automatic kind of like, oh, we need to heal. I don't even know what that means. You know, it's a word that gets thrown around like trauma um, when actually I think that um, these moments become the catalyst to renew ourselves, to continue the, to the struggle and the resistance. You know, so as um, Melanie Yazi and Nick Estes often um, lets us know and the Red Nation lets us know, um, resistance is, a tra is an indigenous um, tradition. You know, and I think that's one of the, the things that's, that's, a, that's really important to, to, to know and to carry through. Um, and, uh, I think, and so I see it, I, I think I see a, a shift in the language um, around what our response should be. And so I was thinking about that on Thursday when I went to these events and they, they touched me more than I thought they would because I'm dealing with these issues all the time um, as the chair of the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission. We have a question from the attendees that I'm gonna throw out here from Jay Dean who says, I'm totally into this idea that we don't need a spiritual cultural relationship with settlers. We need a political relationship. Further questions, do settlers need to develop a relationship with the land here where they now live in order to fight for it or to fight well alongside us as native peoples? So do they need to have the same connection? You know, how do we, you know, like you talked about the Red Nation thing, Melanie, you know, how do we, and this is for anybody to answer that wants to, you know, what is the responsibility of a settler who wants to create this political relationship, forge this political relationship? I mean, I have ideas about it just when it comes to identifying who should be enrolled in our, in our tribes, you know, um, but I'm curious if anybody has any thoughts on, you know, how, how do we, faithfully engage with a settler who wants to develop that political relationship. Because that's what it is. People think about uh, indigenous people and the relationship like say with the United States between tribes, it's not one of race. And that's where we get so caught up even as members, as, as indigenous people, our relationship with the government is not about race. It's about politics. It's about us being sovereign nations. So, you know, one of the arguments that I make is that indigenous, because the long game of blood quantum and all the bullshit blood rules is just, is just genocide spread out over generations. Yet, if we want to survive as tribes, we need to figure out ways that we can bring in other people like we did traditionally, you know, years before settlers, you know, where tribes were, where people would move among different, you know, nations just, just for, for marriages and, and relationships. And that's the same way that we would need to exist in now. I mean, Doreen, do you have a thought on that? I don't think um, people who don't, don't come from this land can have that same relationship that we have with it. Mm -hmm. it um, the soil and the blood of this land is inside of us. We will lay down and die for it tomorrow. We will fight to the death to protect it. And I don't, you know, I, I, I see these um, soldiers going off and fighting people in other countries and taking their sovereignty away from them, getting involved in fights that have nothing to do with them, killing and murdering them. And they think they're warriors. They think they're fighters, but they would come back to this land and they wouldn't die to protect it. They wouldn't die to protect the water and the, um, keep, to keep the pollution out. So I don't think that they, they can have that same conviction as we have. I think the closest thing I've ever seen is farmers. But farmers don't love the land in the way we do. They love it for the economy that it can grow for, for them. And they fight for it to protect that economy. They don't fight for it to protect its existence and its, its uh, purity. And... Uh, you know, our relationship with them, 
we've been working on that. I think kind of who's can talk more about it, but you know, when non-Indigenous people come into our circle, they're, they're trained right away and they're told where their place is. It's behind us. Don't start coming up here thinking you're going to talk for us. Mm -hmm. You know, there were whole trainings that were developed at Standing Rock and Kanahus has a whole training that she's evolved at the tiny house encampment. Um, And then that's what you have to do. You know, it hurts them sometimes, but it's the way you explain it. I had to tell a woman one time that she was taking the food right out of Indigenous children's mouths by holding a job she shouldn't hold. It hurt her feelings, but she woke up and left that job. I said, you know, an Indigenous woman could do that job. And if she held that job inside this Indigenous organization, she could feed her children. But you are taking up space here. You want to help this organization volunteer, but give up that job and give it to an an Indigenous woman came in and took that job. And it was a hard lesson for her to learn. But they, you know, sometimes you have to be fairly blunt. Yeah. Well, how about cops? So that's another thing that, that people who live in a certain uh, economic or, or racial strata that many of us don't occupy, their fear of cops is that maybe they're going to get pulled over and get a ticket that they don't want to pay. Yet, like Conhus, where you are, I imagine you have moments where you actually fear for your life every day because of the police. Because those dudes up there aren't in like little shorts and a little smoky bear hat and a taser. You've got dudes strapped like for military. How, how, do you, how do you explain that relationship to someone who has no concept of the fact that they basically have to have an eye over their shoulder every day? I mean, I saw the picture you posted the other day of being followed by people in SUVs, you know, to keep track of and, and make sure that you don't get yourself caught out where you don't have someone around who knows where you are and where you should be. That's a totally different interaction with like the primary infrastructure of society. If you want to talk about cops being the, those who serve and protect us. Right. Is that my cue to come on and and smash on the cops? Um, Well, (laughs) yeah, the, the RCMP is a federal policing body and agency. Um, It's, it represents like down in the states, they have the state troopers and border patrol and all these different policing agencies. Well, here in Canada, it's all under the RCMP minus the municipal police that are in like Vancouver or like Vancouver police or, and then in Quebec, they have their own police. Um, I'm not gonna even attempt to say it because I don't speak French, but they're just as evil as the RCMP. And here right now, where I'm at right here, at the fight with the Trans Mountain Pipeline, we're also dealing with private security. So there's like the whole private security element. Um, when we were just in trial, we, we got word from right from the private security mouth that he had 36 years of RCMP experience. He's hired by Trans Mountain to also be the private investigator. So that's why they have all these vehicles parked all over. Um, they have high powered you know, video cameras always filming us, anyone coming in and out of our our home, our tiny house village, or else even anyone and any native people driving on Highway 5, which is the Yellowhead Highway from Kamloops, all the way up to Edmonton, they're following people. So we had the two hummingbird women, I don't know if people heard about the hummingbird women, two non-native women that went and found the nesting of the hummingbirds, and then they were able to stop one kilometer of this 1000 kilometer pipeline in two different sections. So that's like two kilometers that they were able to stop a construction. But those two white women, just typical Canadian white women were followed just as heavily as as me because they wanted to instill this fear on anybody that comes and puts any type of support behind us. Mm -hmm. Um, Right now we're working on getting installed some human rights cameras so we can continue to document and and pull out all the harassment at the hands of the police and these private security agencies. Um, Just to let you also know that they're also facing the same thing up at the Wet'suwet'en territory. I'm listening to Molly Wickham talk about five private security companies that are up there in their homelands and their yinta and constantly following them around parked outside of homes, outside of reservations um, and outside of homes that are in the little settler towns of activists and land defenders, same here. It, it doesn't stop, they, they target us, they harass us, they, they actually um, make, uh, build up 
issues for us to stand up and like they're creating conflicts. They're creating conflicts for us to stand up and fight back so the police could be there and they could target us. So we're even more muzzled and gagged. They have like a injunction, a province-wide court injunction for a thousand kilometers, plus everybody that gets arrested on top of that has 100 meter bands from any type of Trans Mountain pipeline infrastructure, not mm -hmm. the, the, the terminal stations, the marine stations, the pumping stations, any lease lands, and then making bands. Like even before COVID, we had bands not to wear facial masks, so we couldn't wear masks. Um, and the reason why we did that, and people know when we're doing that in the movement, is it, it is to protect ourselves because then they target us because we want to go to the grocery store after, we want to go here after and not be targeted by the police everywhere we go. Um, it's sort of hard for me now because I'm identifiable. Even when I do mask up, my kids say, oh, they totally know that's you because I'm who I'm rolling with, my kids. And I, you know, the, they could identify me easily. But uh, one thing is that I don't have no fear of them. I don't have no fear of them because when I'm standing up for what we're standing up for, like my Auntie Doreen said, we'll lay our life down tomorrow for our land. So it doesn't fear us. We know that the work that we're doing is going to benefit our children and our children's children all the way down the, the line until the end of time. Like that's why we're here. We're here for our land, for our children, you know, for our future and nothing's going to deter us from that. And the police could, you know, have another million dollar budget on us and it's not going to deter us. They've threatened to bring in the military on any resistance against the pipeline and it's still not going to make us back down. We're going to stand our ground here in our territory. And that's why um, I was born, I believe, is to stand fiercely on our territory and defend it. And I'm going to continue to, to honor that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. And we're coming down to the final minute of our hour. I don't know if anybody else through YouTube or through the Zoom thing have any other questions, but um, I think what you said really sums up like, like the spirit behind this book is that, you know, we're here, you took your best shot and we're still here and we're not going anywhere. And if anything, we're rising and it's either participate, give us back what belongs to us or get the fuck out of the way, right? That's that's kind of what it comes down to. And I don't know if anybody, in, in, if any of you have any final thoughts you would like to add before we close this thing down, um, go for it. Melanie? Who well, always <laughs> have final thoughts. You know, <laughs> like the question, right, about like, do, do non-native people need to develop a relationship, a personal relationship with the land in order to do this work? No. Doreen, you answered that question really well. Mm -hmm. This isn't about you. I know yep. that's hard. I wow. know that's hard to hear. I heard it from all of my elders growing up, okay? All of the native women who struggled before me to make sure that I could be here, they're like, this isn't about you. And Kana House just said it. This isn't about you, isn't it? It's not even about me as an individual. You mm -hmm. know, who is it? Elizabeth Cooklin, or was it Madonna Thunderhawk was like, your life doesn't belong to you. You know, your life belongs to the future. So what are you gonna do right here and now to ensure that our people, not just our people, but life has a future? Like that's what Conahos just said. And so, no, this ain't about you as an individual. This isn't about your personal journey. What are you gonna do to ensure that not just native people, but life, that mother earth has a future, right? That's the question that, that's not just a question, that's, the, that's what's in our hearts as indigenous people, especially native women. And that's why we do what we do. And so, you know, like put that, uh, put that shit aside and just join, like get to work. Cause like we have a ticking clock in terms of extinction for many species, many of our relatives. So I don't, you know, like if you don't understand how bad police violence is or like what we need to do in order to ensure that there's an, that there's a, a future for this planet, I'm not really sure what I can do for you any longer. Because the rest of us, like, as you said in the book title, we are indigenous people and lots of people. There's a third intifada that has started in Palestine in the last 10 days, okay? Like, the, 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 call, the people of the world are rising up and we're going to keep rising. And this is what's going to mark the next decade of our lives as a planet. We're going to keep rising and we're not going to back down. So are you going to join that struggle? Or are you going to get in the way of that struggle because you're going to center your own feelings and like the fact that you're having a hard time. 
that's just really the simple, that's the, the question that confronts you. I hope you join us because regardless of whether or not you do, we're going to keep moving forward because like that's, that's the only thing we can do. That's, that's the only way we're going to have a future. Well, thank you. Thank all of you very much for participating in this. It was, I was very excited to be part of it and I'm really happy that I was part of it. I think it was, I, I don't really even care what any of the people watching thought of it. I liked it. That's good enough for me. So I don't know. Enjoy the rest of your lives and we'll see you down the road. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, everyone. This was so good. <laughs> <laughs>